Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka the Venom Vlog, and thank you for being patient with me for finishing Ultimate Week. Uh, obviously, we had a couple things pop up last week, the Venom number one review, and then, uh, you know, which I wasn't expecting to get to till the weekend, but, you know, came up with some extra money, was able to go buy it, so that was really awesome. Uh, and then also we had, a, we did a couple of videos about like the Venom first host update and things like that. So we had things that filled up our week, and you guys, you know, I'm trying to stick to just five episodes a week right now, but uh, if I have a plan of like Ultimate Week or something like that, I might you might get a sixth or seventh video uh, just because you know I, I want to keep up with movie stuff as well. Uh, but I know we're going to be a little slow on movie news from here till probably Comic Con, and every once in a while we might get some updates. There was a couple minor updates on the IMDb with a few actors that are you know been added, but they're all playing like smaller parts or they're listed as uncredited. Uh, so it's nothing major, no major announcements right now for the movie. So I appreciate you guys being patient with me during that, and while we're you know waiting for movie news, we are going to cover a lot of comic book stuff this month because it is the 30th anniversary of Venom and I wanted to cover a, di a couple different versions of Venom since we went through a lot of Eddie Brock stuff it's fun to get into some of the other versions of the character and so today what we're going to talk about is Ultimates number three uh, or Ultimates volume three I guess it was called and uh, just issue one and a little bit of issue two uh, because Venom pops up in issue one and Spider-Man briefly pops up in issue two so we're going to talk about that real quick uh, and kind of how that ties into the Ultimate Universe version of Venom and then we're going to talk about the conclusion of the Venom story where we go into Ultimate uh, Comics, I think it was Volume 4, and it was called Venom War. And once again, uh, Brian Michael Bendis uses the word war and he... It's like he doesn't know the definition of the word because War of the Symbiotes was like three pages of a battle. And in this one, it's more than just three pages of battle for sure. Uh, but it's hardly, I would categorize it as a war in a way. Uh, but still, we're going to get into that. So, uh, And I think this kind of concludes the Ultimate Universe version of Venom. So without further ado, let's dive right into it. So first up, we're going to start with Ultimates 3, and Ultimates is a book in the Ultimate Universe that is basically the ultimate version of the Avengers, and I don't know why they didn't go with just Ultimate Avengers. I mean, we had Ultimate Spider-Man, Ultimate X-Men. It would have made sense to just call it Ultimate Avengers, and we had Ultimate Fantastic Four later, but for whatever reason, I decided to call them the Ultimates, and a part of me is kind of glad for that because having the Avengers name on this book, like, it just wouldn't fit. All the other characters still tried to act like the characters they were the Ultimate versions of for the most part, but Ultimates was not like that. Like, everyone on this team is just a straight-up dick. Like, I don't like any character on this team. I don't even know why we're rooting for them, and most of the time, I don't root for them. Uh, and so the first two books, the volumes were written by Mark Millar, and this was kind of like him doing, like, TV show versions. He was like, all right, season one is 12 issues, and then they renumbered it, and they did season two, you know, whatever. So this is season three, essentially, but it only lasted five issues, and it was written by Jeff Loeb, and they brought Ed, Mc uh, not Ed McGinnis, uh, but uh, Joe Madeira. And Joe Madeira was this amazing comic book artist in like the late 90s going into the early 2000s um, he did a couple indie things did a big a book called battle chasers which i really love which has a video game version of it out now which is really great go pick it up if you like rpgs um, and he's just he was a really great artist but he disappeared from comics for a while to do video games and this was kind of a return for him to come back to comics. So I was very excited to see his art again. And on a book like Ultimates, I was like, all right, maybe they'll go in a new direction. Maybe they'll eventually be called the Ultimate Avengers. And maybe we can see them be a little bit more heroic and less, you know, like super drama-y. Because it, it was just really bad. Like, you know, and then this book starts off and immediately diminished my hopes for that. It starts off with Tony Stark having a sex tape leak on the internet. And, uh, and you're like, Okay, so they're going to still write them as these kind of people, these kind of characters. And you're like, all right, I can understand, like, all right, that's hap that was happening at the time and, you know, with different things leaking out there. I think at that point it was probably like Paris Hilton or, or you know, one of those, you know, wasn't uh, current stuff, obviously. Uh, but it was interesting that they, I was like, oh, maybe they're going to make a comment on this. And of course they don't. They, that's just the setup so that Venom could bust through the wall of the Avengers mansion and start fighting all the Avengers for seemingly no reason. He's looking for the woman. He's like, give me the woman, give me the woman. Uh, we find out later he's talking about Scarlet Witch. So apparently he was sent here to find and kill Scarlet Witch. And you're like, okay, what's happening now? Like as a fan of reading these books, you're like, What's going on? And he's also shown up in the black costume with the spider on his chest, which is video game continuity, but not comic book continuity. So it makes you wonder when and when, uh, or where and when, the, you know, Joe Madeira started drawing this thing during this timeline. Because in the video game, the whole point of that in the video game was he, you know, Venom would absorb Peter Parker and then look like the comic book Venom that a lot of us know, where he has the spider on his chest and everything like that. Uh, but in the comic version in War of the Symbiotes, as you saw, which came out right around this time and to credit itself as taking place 
before Ultimates 3. Uh, this, you know, so they already established, here's the timeline. This takes place before. But in War of the Symbiotes, they don't show Venom when he absorbs Carnage. He doesn't turn into the version with the spider on his chest. So he turns into an even bigger, more malformed version. And you're like, wait, what's happening? So when he crashes through the wall and he's Venom, you're like with the, you know, the, the 616 version, like the classic version of Venom that we know, not the Ultimate version, and the maybe closer to the Ultimate Spider-Man video game, you're like, What's happening? Like, why, why is this Venom here? And he goes around, he starts fighting everybody. Everyone takes turns punching him, kicking him. Uh, then Black Panther shows up. And this is our first introduction to Ultimate Black Panther. And he shows up and takes a right hook to, you know, to Venom. He starts beating the crap out of him, punch him in the gut, you know, going after him. Uh, but uh, Venom is resistant to all this. He's fighting back. He's like, show me Scarlet Witch. I want Scarlet Witch. I came here for her. And everyone's like, we don't know why you want her, but, we, you know, we're going to take you down. We're going to stop you. Uh, and obviously all of, all of them, they said they read, like, some kind of S.H.I.E.L.D. briefing on Venom. So you're like, okay, that kind of makes sense. At the end of War of the Symbiotes, I guess the, you know, S.H.I.E.L.D. kind of has a symbiote in a way, or they don't actually, Latveria took it uh, with the Beetle, so you're, but maybe they had research with, you know, Gwen and Carnage and stuff, so you're like, all right, may, there's definitely files on Venom for sure for them to read up on, uh, but they all seem to really know Venom very well, and I guess it's like, oh, well, in Ultimate Comics, they did fight Peter Parker as Venom, so the, it's there, the continuity's there, but it's just kind of, you're, it's hard to, when you're reading it this way, you're like, ah, okay, what's, what's all going on, what's happening, and you have to sit there and really think about, well, what's in canon, what's not in canon, what was from the video game, what's from the War of the Symbiote comic, um, so they did have an interaction with a Venom before. So they're all fighting him. They think they know his weaknesses. Uh, they have Valkyrie show up. She comes in. This is our first introduction to her. She swings in, jumps off a of Pegasus, and like cuts Venom in half, like you know, with her sword. But then he starts to heal, coming back, and you see that there's actually no human inside of him. It doesn't look like. Uh, so even though there's like some fleshy looking parts and some blood, I think uh, you're like, wait. So it's a it's a human, but so but the human part can heal. So is this Eddie Brock? Like what's going on? Uh, and then he like, you know, Venom throws um, Black Panther like a, a few city blocks away, knocks Valkyrie away. And then because he hit Valkyrie, finally Thor jumps in and Thor like electrocutes Venom to death, essentially. And then Venom, you see him like, you know, falling apart, his arms coming off. And then he just turns into a big puddle of goo. And all of them go, wow, when does Venom turn into a puddle of goo? And it's like, well, he does. <laughs> like in, in War of the Symbiotes, they established uh, that he can get sucked into, you know, the Beatles thing. So apparently Eddie Brock can turn into goo. Or when he got away from the, you know, the Ultimates and S.H.I.E.L.D., he turned into goo to go into the sewer. So I'm like, so wait, so he doesn't turn into <laughs> well it doesn't matter because what we find out later is that ultron or hank pym like a, a cyborg version of hank pym called ultron in the ultimate universe he created this venom to be a distraction or to send them after scarlet witch so they could separate scarlet witch later um so if it, if it, you know if this venom killed Scar scarlet witch then it was a success but otherwise it was mainly a distraction to get everyone away and then so they could go kill scarlet witch you know somewhere over here you know a little bit later when she's you know reminiscing about this you know with pietro or she's out like with pietro and she gets killed that way so uh so you're like okay so they just threw venom in here pretty much jeff Loeb, you know did this with hush with uh you know in batman where he talked to um jim lee and said who do you want to draw and jim lee said i want to draw all these characters you know and then so jeff Loeb found a way to write those characters in and i think that's probably what happened here he was like hey uh, who do you want to draw and uh and joe mattier was probably like oh well you know it'd be cool to do you know valkyrie or something maybe it would be cool to do uh, Black Panther and who knows maybe some of those were Jeff Loeb's things and maybe some of them were Joe Mattiera's but I feel like Venom was like oh let's let's throw Venom in here just to have like a cool popcorn movie fight and uh, and it makes really little sense you don't know why Hank Pym would you know clone Venom of all things he made like a cyborg android and cloned like a symbiote sample or something and put it on him and sent it after Scarlet Witch so whatever uh, <laughs> so, so it doesn't really matter to, overall to the major plot it's just Hank Pym, Ultron, trying to kill the uh, Ultimate Avengers or the Ultimates. And so he just used this, you know, version to do it, I guess. And you're just like, okay, he used Venom to do that, whatever. <laughs> it's like, to me, that's, uh, it was it was just a waste. It was this there for visuals. And then later on, you find out Black Panther's not even Black Panther. It was Captain America dressed up as a new superhero that he was calling Black Panther, I guess. And they're left wondering if Black Panther is a real character in the Ultimate Universe. And whatever. I don't want to get into the Ultimates 3, the whole book. I just want to talk about the Venom part. Uh, but then in the second issue, uh, because Venom is tied to Spider-Man, and in the S.H.I.E.L.D. briefing, it does mention Spider-Man. 
Spider-Man. Uh, Hawkeye decides to go after, like, after, you know, Scarlet Witch is dead. He's, you know, fed up, and he's like, no, I'm going to go kill this thing. And so he goes after Spider-Man and says, like, how, you know, did you send Venom after us? And he, like, shoots at Spider-Man, hits him with a trink dart, and he knows Spider-Man is a kid, an underage kid. He knows that uh, when before he starts the battle. And he puts a gun right to Peter's head. So, like, again, none of these people are good people. Hawkeye is, like, a total scumbag in this universe. Um, and maybe for good reason he did lose, like, his entire family. But at the same time, like, it's just too much like he's just too much and he's going after this kid and he's like if you sent venom after us i'm gonna kill you and then captain america shows up and says hey knock it off like we gotta go like you know scarlet you know scarlet witch has been shot or whatever and then so they leave and uh and then that's it that's like the only reason spider-man's in there so again i think joe matt was like hey i want to draw spider-man and jeff's like fine i'll just do this scene and you get spider-man in there so that's what this book feels like it's what does the artist want to draw the book and uh, and it doesn't come across as a coherent story and you, you're kind of left wondering why venom and spider-man were used at all other than to maybe kind of tie it into the ultimate universe in a way but really it doesn't really matter so uh yeah so my review of ultimates three uh, at least these pages with venom in them is i love the art i think joe matt era drew the crap out of this it looks fantastic the art's amazing uh the colors and light you know everything that's done on them the inks like it just pops it looks good as you saw from the artwork up here but for the story it's dog shit it's absolute bad and you know i don't like to be down on things especially jeff Loeb, who i am a big fan of and i know he's gone through a lot in his personal life uh but you know I, sometimes you got to just look at the story in front of you and this story just did nothing for me if you take out all the other equations i'm looking at this as a reviewer and just looking at the story to tell a discussion video and it didn't work for me. So maybe you guys feel differently. So let me know what you think of Ultimates down below. And speaking of, you know, things that aren't really well thought out, let's get right into Venom War. Venom War takes place during the graphic novel, or you can buy it in graphic novel form, still available now, and I think in digital as well. Um, you could pick it up. It's a, a volume four of Ultimate Comic Spider-Man. So after Ultimate Spider-Man ended at like issue 160 peter parker died then they did the death of spider-man and they did a couple issues there they introduced miles morales and then they restarted the franchise with ultimate uh, comic spider-man and uh, and we got you know um, miles morales you know his storyline and uh and then an issue like 16.1 and then which i know 0.1 so like marvel doesn't care about numbers from sales numbers to the numbers on the comic book issue like marvel doesn't care about numbers they do whatever the heck they want uh but uh but the first appearance of this venom actually happens in ultimate comic spider-man number one dr marcus and he was spelled with marcus with a k m-a-r-k-u-s that's how he was spelled originally Later on, he would be called Dr. Marcus with a C. So, uh, and it's from the same writer. You're just like, how could you screw this up? Oh my God, just go back and read your stuff. Where's the editors on these books? Um, so yeah, so Marcus with a C, he becomes. But he starts off with Marcus with a K, and it starts off with uh, Ultimate Comics number one is Norman Osborn talking to Dr. Marcus. And he says, hey, I'm pulling you from Roxxon. I bought out your contract because you're the best in this field. You're smarter in this than I'm willing to admit, you know, like, and he's also like, I couldn't crack this. Uh, and, you know, and then the guy's like, Dr. Marcus is like, well, Audio Octavius probably could have cracked this formula. And he's like, we don't mention that name in this lab. Like, you know, I, I worked with that guy before and we don't work together anymore. Uh, so don't mention his name. And he's like, but I created Spider-Man with these, like, you know, with this specific spider. So, I need you to, you know, like, here's a couple of versions of those spiders. I need you to replicate what we did. And he's like, and I think you're the man to do it. And he's like, if you don't, I'm going to kill you. And he's like, but if you do, you're going to have, like, the greatest life ever. So Dr. Marcus is like, okay, fine. I'll, you know, I'll, start, I'll work on this project. Well, of course, almost instantly, one of the spiders, Spider 42, got away. And that's the spider that we know bit Miles Morales. Um, and I think there was some storylines between, like, you know, the end of Peter Parker and the beginning of this. Uh, so you kind of got a little bit of sense of who Miles Morales was and like his uncle and all that stuff. Uh, but uh, but here we get into like his uncle being the prowler and they you know goes into that story. Then you jump ahead to issue 16.1. Uh, <laughs> why they couldn't just make an annual or something, I don't know. Uh, but they did 16.1, and this is like, you know, a year or so after the Miles story started. We Now we know that his uncle was a prowler. His uncle recently died in the comics. Um, his dad, uh, Jefferson, was a former, you know, like his uncle, like I said, was a prowler, but his dad was like part of that. Like they, they did like illegal activities together, the two brothers. But then Jefferson went the straight and narrow path and uh, and got married and had a kid. And Jeff, you know, his Jefferson's brother, the prowler, 
step, you know, kept going. And obviously, you guys know that in the ult or the Spider-Man Homecoming movie, uh, Donald Glover, Childish Gambino, who, um, who released a great music video recently, uh, he is playing uh, Miles' uncle in Spider-Man Homecoming. And he mentions that he has a nephew that, you know, lives on the streets of New York, and he's kind of worried about him uh, as this escalation of supervillains, you know, happens. So, uh, so yeah, so they kind of start to establish that in the movie universe. Uh, but for the comic universe here, we have 16.1, and pretty much this whole issue is just Betty Brant uh, working at the Daily Bugle, and she's talking to J. Jonah Jameson, and she has a theory of who she thinks Spider-Man is, the new Spider-Man. And so she's, you know, trying to tell everyone, like, look, I think I figured it out. Here's a video of Spider-Man standing over the Prowler as he dies. And the Prowler's last words were something like, you know, uh, admit it, you're you're a lot like me. And then and then there's something something akin to that. And then the Prowler dies, and you can see Spider-Man's mask ripped, and you see, you know, a young African American kid under there or you see at least african-american you know black skin under there and so she's like oh wait i think you know he might be related or connected somehow to this um prowler character and of course you know robbie Ro joe robert robertson's like uh how long have you lived in new york and what all black people are related and she's like you know i'm not like that she's like i'm just saying that line specifically that he says from this like cell phone footage or whatever uh that was captured during the battle She's like, I think there's a connection there. So she starts digging. She starts looking into it. Um, and the, one of the things she does is she goes to uh, the Prowler's apartment and is trying to rent it. Like she's pretending like she's going to rent the apartment. So some guy shows her around and then he leaves. And she goes down and like finds the spider. Like she finds a floorboard loose, picks it up, opens it up, and finds uh, Spider 42. So uh, she brings that to Dr. Con uh, Marcus, Dr. Conrad Marcus with a C now, uh, Marcus with a C, and she brings it to him and says, hey, you weren't returning my calls, but I found your spider, and I want to know about Spider-Man, and I want to know how this got out and who the new Spider-Man is, and I'm trying to figure it out, and I think it might be Jefferson Davis, who is the brother of the Prowler who died recently. I think he's, so she's suspecting that Miles' father is is Spider-Man, and so uh, so that's her like her big theory, and so she's uh, she must not be a very good reporter because she if she can't tell the structural difference between like an adult in the costume and a kid, especially after Peter Parker who was a kid was Spider-Man before Miles has got to be in the ballpark of that kind of build. So it's just weird to me that she, you know, she must not be that very good, yet she's still piecing all this together somehow. So you're like, whatever. So uh, so she, you know, Betty Brant's work in this case, uh, Dr. Conrad, or Dr. Conrad Marcus, we see again. So he's like, wait, you know, you know where Spider-Man is? You think he's this guy? What's going on? And she's like, well, I just wanted, wanted some information from you. He works at Roxxon now, like Dr. Marcus after Oscorp went under he went and started working back at Roxxon to finish his contract over there. Uh, so we don't know exactly what he's doing over there, what he's working on, because Bendis doesn't give a crap about setting up a backstory to this villain at all, uh, but he will eventually become Venom in this book. And, uh, and then we cut back to Betty Brant. She's still working things out. And when she gets back home, she's like, you know, she quits the Daily Bugle because J. Joan Jameson will not run the story. He says, look, that kid, Peter Parker, he died a hero. He was, he was like 16 years old and he saved a bunch of people in New York. And I gave him guff and I tried to out him and I tried to ruin his life. And he was just a kid. And she's like, so I, if you figured out who the new Spider-Man is, I ain't running the story. You can go run it somewhere else. And I know it'll sell papers and I know it'll put us through the roof, but I don't care. I'm not going to ruin some kid's life. If it is a new person, if it's this kid's dad or if it's the kid, whatever it is, I ain't ruining their lives. Like I already tried to do that once and, it, and I'm, I'm broken from it. And so J. Jonah Jameson's like, doing the right thing and he's like I'm not running this story so she goes and she's going to go sell it to some other paper but before she does Venom shows up and kills her and that's how basically the 16.1 issue ends and then after that we get a four issue story that's it four issues called Venom War and even though it's a pretty much a, a consistent battle throughout most of this series or the most of these four issues it is far from a war in my opinion although there are casualties so maybe you know Miles Morales the character might disagree with me on that one so in the first part of Venom War, we start off, uh, J. Jonah Jameson is talking to a, uh, a detective, Detective Maria Hill. So in this universe, she's not like head of S.H.I.E.L.D. or anything. She's a detective, uh, but she's very good at her job. She's trying to figure out what's going on, who killed Betty Brant. She's talking to J. Jonah Jameson, and he admits, hey, she came to me. She thinks she knows who the new Spider-Man is. And, uh, and she's like, well, did she tell you? And even though she did tell J. Jonah Jameson, he says, no, he's like, no, I don't know who the new Spider-Man is, or I don't know her theory. She came to me. I said, I wouldn't run the story. And then 
you know, Marie Hill's like, why wouldn't you? That would sell a lot of papers. And then he goes into the explanation of Peter Parker again. He's like, look, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to ruin someone's life. Uh, someone who's just trying to do the right thing. Uh, even if they screw up, they're still trying to do the right thing. And I ain't going to do, I ain't going to, you know, try to out them at all. So Maria Hill is like, all right, well, I'm going to, you know, keep working on the story and, and figure out what's going on. And then over, you know, meanwhile, Miles is, you know, going about his regular life, going to school, everything like that. Um, when he comes home, there's a TV uh, reporter crew, a camera crew that's outside his house that uh, got a tip from, you know, someone who contacted, um, uh, or basically someone who Betty Brant contacted about her theory. Like, hey, if you can give me this book deal, I think I knew Spider-Man is. They got a tip. And so they went to Miles' house to uh, interrogate his father. And they were just like, hey, you know, can you tell us what's going on? You know, how, you know, are you really the new Spider-Man? Like, your brother was the prowler, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he's like, how'd you find out where I lived? What's going on? Like, why are you here harassing me, harassing my family, putting us through this? Why are you doing this? And before they can answer or get into anything, uh, Venom shows up. And this is something that consistently happens in Spider-Man comics that that Brian Michael Bendis writes especially in the Ultimate comics which is where two people seem like they're, they're gonna have a real conversation about something like you know him showing up and saying like hey camera crew why are you here what led you here what you know why did you come here and he's like trying to connect with them on like an adult level like you're scaring my kid you're scaring my family like you know please don't come here please don't do this you you have something of someone trying to have a rational conversation and then a monster shows up or an enemy shows up it always happens like there's like an issue later on where where uh where pete or or uh, i think it's like a year later where miles is talking to gwen stacy in a chinese restaurant and it's uh, after the events of this book and then they're like about to have a heart to heart and then like the the wait the owner of the Chinese restaurant that Gwen Stacy works at is like trying to talk to the customers and trying to talk to Miles' dad and they're about to have like a possibly human conversation and then like an enemy shows up called Bombshell. So it's like it always, always happens. It's like this guy is trope the city. Like he just, just writes, he just finds one thing that he does and he just keeps doing it over and over and over. And to me, he just doesn't evolve. And it, that's why a lot of these books I'm kind of harsh on because I know Brian Michael Bendis is a good writer and I've seen him do amazing stuff, but I get frustrated when he phones things in. And it's a lot of times it's because he's writing too many books at once and he's just not paying attention to what he's doing. And, uh, and it seems like the editors aren't either. And so it kind of drives me a little bit crazy that someone with so much skill and potential uh, is wasting it a lot of times. Um, so in this book, luckily Sarah Pacelli draws this part because uh, uh, Marquez, I think, drew the 16.1 the storyline. Uh, but this one is drawn by Sarah Pacelli and it's beautiful. Like the, this book is really gorgeous. I love her artwork. Uh, so as Venom shows up, he's outside. He's like, you know, terrorizing uh, Miles' dad and the film crew and it's like this new venom it's you know big you saw the pictures you, they're popping up here on screen uh but he is massive and he's coming after these people trying to kill them and he thinks jefferson is the key he's like you're spider-man you must have the dna that i need to control this symbiote and you're like okay okay so whoa this is this eddie again like because it's big and, and gross looking like eddie was just drawn by a different artist so i just thought well maybe that's her interpretation of eddie evolving uh so i thought maybe this could still be eddie uh but no well after the lotveria thing and then after peter died like eddie never shows up and it makes no sense and the only thing i can think of is because bendis just doesn't care he doesn't care what happens to eddie brock or what that story would have been because he decided to go in a different direction and yet he's still phoning in a lot of these scripts uh, so, you know, Miles shows up, he's trying to fight Venom, they get into this big battle, and it actually goes for more than three pages, it's awesome, uh, the fight is great, Sarah Pacelli, her action scenes are fantastic, you see uh, Miles trying to use some of his powers, because he has different powers in Spider-Man uh, that Peter Parker did, he has a lot of the same ones, but he has this one called like the Venom Sting, or something like that, and he'll like punch you, and it like stings and sends like an electric volt through you, and obviously we know that the electricity is a, a weakness to this new Venom symbiote, uh, so Miles is learning that as he's fighting it and he hits it once and it actually hurts the symbiote uh, but then cops show up they start getting in the way miles makes sure his father's safe gets him out of the way but then his father gets thrown into a car by venom and then miles just loses it starts kicking him like kicking him in the face and splitting like parts of the symbiote's head open and he's just like going all out fighting this thing and he's actually starting to win uh fighting with you know and the cops are shooting it from behind and miles is punching it in the front and they're actually starting to win and then so the venom suit decides to retreat and go away and it leaves miles um you know uh basically like you know alone with his wounded father and the suit does when it's destroyed and it falls again in, into goo and goes into the sewer so again i'm assuming that whoever bonds with the suit i guess can turn into goo like it's like wh where's the human host because later we find there is a human host uh but eddie the reason he turned into goo maybe is because he got complete control 
uh, after absorbing Peter's DNA. So what's the excuse here? So again, the, the continuity of just how things work don't make sense. It's just like, hey, what looks cool on paper? Draw it, and then we'll just, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. We won't explain it. Uh, so, you know, his still long story short, uh, Miles you know, or rant aside, I should say, uh, Miles' dad gets taken away in an ambulance. And the next issue or two uh, pretty much take place mostly in the hospital. But we do before we get there do cut to Gwen Stacy and Mary Jane, and they see this happening on the news, this attack, and they decide to finally go introduce themselves to Miles Morales. So they go and show up and talk to Miles and say, like, hey, we knew Peter Parker, we were friends of his, and Miles kind of was like, oh, I think I saw you guys there when he died or something, or at his funeral. Um, and so they all kind of start talking and becoming friends. Genki, his best friend, uh, who Ned is kind of based off of in the Homecoming movies, um, Genki's there, and they're all, like, you know, conversing about what's going on. And then Maria Hill shows up, and she's like, hey, I know, you know, that your dad might have been Spider-Man. He, I was, I tracked. I'm following these clues about uh, this reporter who apparently figured out who your dad was. But it seems like your dad wasn't Spider-Man. And Maria Hill's like, I think it's you, kid. And uh, and if so, like, you know, Venom isn't going to stop. He's still out there, and he still believes your dad is some kind of key to something, or at least he knows his dad. Your dad will be good bait to lure you out. So you need to get to wherever your dad is. You need to go to the hospital right now. Um, and so Venom, you know, while that's happening, Venom's slinking around the sewers. He comes out through a sewer lid again, eats a couple people nearby, and goes and attacks the hospital. And meanwhile, you know, uh, Miles is trying to get a few last words in with Gwen. He finds out that he's like, how do you know so much about symbiotes? And she's like, well, I used to be one, and now I guess I'm a human being, and the suit was left me, and it was absorbed by a venom. And so, uh, but here's some of its weaknesses. So he's learning a little bit about, you know, strategy and, and how to fight this thing. And then he's like, okay, good. I'm going to go and I'm going to find my dad. Uh, and I'm going to go to the hospital, be there with him. And if Venom shows up, I'm going to kick the crap out of him. So when he goes there, of course, Venom does show up. And before Miles can get there, though, he shows up and all that's standing in between Miles' dad and Venom is Miles' mom. So the final issue of this book, uh, it actually does end in tragedy, and I think it's really well told for the most part because we don't get like the first pages at Miles Morales at the end of the story flashbacking on how he beat Venom. Uh, that is something that even though Bendis doesn't normally do that in a lot of his stuff, for some reason every time he told a symbiote story, that's what it seemed to be. It seemed to be an out of place, you know, thing, tale at the end where it's like, you know, the War of the Symbiotes, we took first issue was present day and it took us all that time until the last issue to get back to present day so there was still like jump time jumping around and mentioning things that happened before and so i was really impressed that that didn't happen this time and i'm glad it didn't because there's something really emotional in this that would have felt hollow if you would have done that and i think bendis realized that so again you know, i know i'm hard on the guy but I'm hard on him because I know he's a better writer than this. I've seen him write awesome stuff, and then I've seen him phone stuff in for like 10 years. Uh, so to me, I, if I was his editor, I would have challenged him more. And uh, this story is one of them, especially in the villain department. If you wonder why Marvel movie villains sometimes don't get you know well translated or don't get you know good villains in general, it's like look no further sometimes in their comic books and some of the people who are deemed their best writers uh, at the comic company because this Venom was really bad uh we have no idea any of his motivation or anything like all we know is he started off by uh you know the first time we see him he was blowing up an oscorp building that was already condemned anyway and he blew it up and then he went and killed you know he killed betty brant obviously and he's on this path of looking for spider-man so we're like well is it you know eddie like is it not eddie if it was eddie wouldn't he have blown up like a trask building uh so there was clues to leading you who it might be but when they reveal it it's it feels like a hollow reveal as well uh but the rest of the book i thought was pretty good so miles you know now fought his way to uh, he got into the police or not the police station but the hospital and he's fighting venom and the fight is awesome like sarah pacelli her action scenes like i said like she is awesome and the art is fantastic and miles just is not holding up you know, after Miles' mom gets chased down a hallway uh, to, you know, by Venom and he's like eating people and killing cops and everything. And she's trying to get to Miles' dad to keep him safe or go in there and at least be by his side, I guess. Uh, but, you know, that sequence, it's all really great. And then Miles shows up and just starts beating the crap out of Venom. And the art is fantastic. And they're just going at it left and right, left and right. But then, you know, Venom kind of gets the upper hand and, and he grabs Miles and he's like, look, all I need is your DNA to like be in control because you were bit by the spider and, you know, whatever. And I'm like, but how does that make him in control? Because 
you know, if it's not, it's not Eddie clearly at this point, because Eddie was already in control and he got taken to Latveria. So maybe it's like, all right, well, the Latverians created some new Venom symbiote, we're thinking, and it's somehow tied to the beetle. Maybe it is the beetle. Maybe he's inside here and he's like a victim to the symbiote. And he thinks by eating another Spider-Man, uh, the way Venom did, maybe he'll gain control and maybe he just doesn't know. Maybe that's the whole thing is he just doesn't know. Uh, but no, what we find out is inside the suit is is someone, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, it's Dr. Marcus, who is a scientist who worked on the program. You know, he knew about, the, you know, all the, the behind the scenes of creating Spider-Man as close as he, you know, anyone knew anyway. Um, he had all the research there. He knew about the spider that got away. Like, he had all that information. So I don't know why he thought eating Miles or Jefferson or whatever would help him in some way, or even if that was his plan, because you really don't get a sense of anything of what makes this villain tick or why he's doing it. Is he just fed up working for guys like Osborne, and now he's, you know, after Osborne died, he had to go back to Roxxon, and now he's working for the people at Roxxon? Is he just tired of working for powerful men, and he wants power himself? Like, you have no idea what his motivation is. For real, you have no idea. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. Some of you might have read some things in between the lines, so if you did, and you think I'm way off, you know, let me know in the comments. But as far as I could tell on the page, reading through it, I don't know what this guy really wants or why he's doing anything. Uh, but uh, he does grab Miles, starts to absorb him, and as he's absorbing, his, his mask rips. You know, Miles' face is exposed, and he sees his mom, and they lock eyes. And his mom's like, no, like, no, don't take my son, don't take my son. So she grabs, like, a gun from a nearby deceased police officer, picks up the gun, and starts shooting Venom in the face. And it's not even phasing him. And he, you know, so, so of course he, like, slinks up on her, and he's like, you know, your family caused me so much pain, you caused me all this. And you're like, how? Like, maybe because the spider got away, but that was his own negligence that got the spider away, because it kind of slinked away back in, you know, Miles' first issue, Ultimate Comics number one. He had it in a box, and it kind of, like, got out of the box and walked away. So you're like, how, how did this happen? Like, why is this Miles' fault and the Davis family's fault? Uh, but it doesn't really matter who cares uh, but she's unloading a gun into him he goes over and grabs her and lifts her up and he's starting to squeeze her like really tight and he's like now that I have your son I'm gonna take you I'll take your husband just to be sure I'll have the whole family and uh, and I guess that that's his big master plan uh, but before he could like you know kill her miles taps into his full potential of his venom blast power and releases electricity destroys the suit sends chunks of it everywhere vaporizes most of it and Dr. Conrad's body falls to the ground um, unconscious at first. Uh, but then Miles' mom falls, and he runs over to be by her side. And then Dr. Marcus starts to get up, and of course the police are freaking out. They see this guy, he used to be a monster. They get up, they grab their, some of them are still alive, they grab their guns, and they blow him away, and they kill Dr. Marcus straight on. And then a few pieces of the symbiote are still flapping around, so they shoot those out too to vaporize those. And leaving Miles Morales all alone with his mom, everyone's trying to pick up the pieces, you know, get get back on their feet, you know, uh, assess the situation. And Miles holding his mom, and he realizes that when Venom was squeezing her, his thumb or finger must have went through her chest, and she's bleeding out and she's dying. And she's looking at her son, locking eyes with him again because some of his face is exposed. And she says, whatever you do, don't tell your father that you're Spider-Man. Promise me right now you won't tell him. And then he's crying and then she dies in his arms. And then it's, I mean, it's really emotional. And Sarah Pacelli did a great job drawing it. And it really added a lot of weight. And I'm glad there were no time jumps in this so you could feel that moment and they really linger on it long enough for you to really feel miles's pain and realize that uh that this venom uh, a villain that is half-assed and hardly fleshed out at all is the reason his mom died it's just so so random and i know again sometimes deaths are but it just reminded me a little bit of the gwen stacy thing where it just felt a little random and uh, and kind of pointless but it does add a lot of uh emotional weight to miles and his story and does propel him into some very interesting stories later on so it did matter o overall like it, it didn't feel like gwen's uh, like on that level at least uh the execution maybe a little bit but not the the outcome of it. I thought it was handled a little bit better in this version. And at the tip end of the book, we do cut to Roxxon Industries and the two of the people, like the guards or like or high level security guys are talking to Mr. Roxxon, the guy who runs the company. And they're like, you know, Mr. Roxxon, we don't know how Marcus got the symbiote. We don't know what's going on. So I guess Roxxon had a symbiote at some point and had a, a sample of it or something. Um, I don't know how they got it. I can't remember. I'm sure maybe it was mentioned or teased at or something in either the video game or in War of the Symbiotes. Uh, it's an oversight on my part if they did mention it. Uh, but uh, they, he's sitting there saying, like, I don't know how Marcus 
had the symbiote, how he got a hold of it, we don't know. So you're, they're trying to explain some things here, but again, none of this really pays off or goes anywhere too, you know, too much. I think they do bring on Roxxon back because that's like Bendis had kind of a hard on for that company and had them since the early days of Ultimate Spider-Man. So having them around still, I think he was just like, all right, let's try to pull them to the forefront and make them bigger villains than they were. Uh, so you kind of get a glimpse of it here and you kind of see the inner workings of them and them trying to figure out how Marcus stole something of theirs and used it in the way he did. Uh, so they have questions just as we as readers have questions. Unfortunately, we just don't get a lot of those answers ever. Uh, but then you cut to Miles. He wakes up in a bed, but he realizes that he's like, oh, am I at home? He runs downstairs to see if his mom's there. He smells cooking, like food cooking, and he sees Genki, and I believe Genki's mom is down there, and he realizes he's at Genki's house, and he's like, and he's and it, 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 it overwhelms him. So we don't know what happened from the moment his mom died to this moment. It just jumps to the next day, I guess, and you know she's gone, uh, and he wakes up in a bed, and he's like, "Oh my God!" And he's fr and he's you know see sees that his mom's not there, and he freaks out, and he goes into the room, tears his you know brings his costume out of his backpack, and just starts ripping it apart, and says, "No more, you know, Spider Man. I'm not gonna be Spider Man anymore." And that does have some weight to an extent. The next issue picks up a year later, so you never get to see what happened in that year. I always hate when writers do that, where they're like, "Hey, we're gonna jump ahead a year," and all the semi-interesting stuff we're just not gonna talk about, <laughs> at least not in this book, or we'll you know. I always hope that when they do that, though, that's when you do use flashback. You say, hey, all right, we can now flashback to the key moments that happened in that year of when Miles maybe decided to not save someone when he could have, you know, and you can see the ramifications of that. Maybe it's coming back to haunt him now. Like, that's a great literary technique to use. Uh, but a lot of times they just skip ahead a year and that's it. And all the emotional stuff that the character went through in that year, they're just like, eh, we, we, I don't want to write that. I, I want to write, I want to get back to the action stuff and the fun stuff. And it's like, uh, okay, well then then don't have these things happen, you know, uh, if you're if that's all you want to write. Um, but I will say that the mom thing dying, again, it's another thing then, uh, that Bendis had to retcon in a way. And I think Hickman did it. I think Hickman and Secret Wars brought Miles' mom's, my mom back, which I thought was pretty neat and the reason he did it was because miles gave um like the molecule man a sandwich like the molecule man was like hey kid i'm hungry and so miles like oh I, I don't know who you are or anything like i'm from another universe and he's like yeah whatever just i smell peanut butter and jelly on you and he's like yeah i have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in my pocket uh, and he's like all right can i have it so miles like sure and he gives it to him and then molecule man's like at the end of the story he's like hey i, I owe you a favor kid so i'm gonna give you your mom back. i found out your mom died I'm going to give her back to you. So she comes back, you know, and I'm like, holy crap, like th that was kind of neat. And I kind of liked that. And it wasn't Bendis doing it. And it was kind of a neat little cosmic kind of moment, uh, which was which was interesting. Uh, so now coming up in the new Venom comics, I think issue three or four, Miles Morales is going to show up. So we're going to be talking about him again very soon when we review Venom, I think issue three or four from the new run by Donny Cates. And as Donny Cates pointed out in an interview, uh, a Venom killed Miles' mom. Even though she came back, he still remembers her death uh, and, and her death by the the hands of a venom so when eddie brock shows up and he's trying to look for answers on this like you know symbiote creature god thing uh miles does come across him and they're gonna fight and my, and eddie doesn't know why the kid hates him and the kid hates him instantly because he's a venom uh and it's gonna be the first time we get to see venom eddie brock meet miles morales so that could be pretty fun so i'm glad we did at least talk about the story so some of you guys out there who may be not familiar with miles morales know about him you know he's a young I think half African American or half black, half Puerto Rican kid, I believe is his heritage. And he was bit by a, a similar spider than the one Peter Parker was bit to uh, or bit from and uh, and then became Spider-Man. He hid it for, for a while, not using his powers. But when he saw Peter Parker die, saving a bunch of people, he was like, all right, it's my responsibility to, you know, you know, become Spider-Man. Um, and so, yeah, I think his journey is pretty cool. He does have his own movie coming out this fall called Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And I'm sure we'll talk about that when we get closer closer because I actually really do like this character and even though Bendis I think dropped the ball on a lot of stories that was written with this character I think overall the character is great and has a lot of potential for great stories that Bendis has tapped into sometimes and other writers have as well uh, but as far as this goes I think I've talked long enough so you guys let me know what do you think of Venom War let me know down in the comments you can pick it up as I said it's in trade paperback volume four and I'll put a link to the Amazon one uh, down below if you want to go pick it up because I think Miles is a good character worth supporting one of the newer editions to the Marvel Universe that I actually dug and I think adds a lot to a lot more to the Marvel Universe than takes away. I think some of the new characters have taken away things or just not added anything. I think Miles has added a ton um, and so for that reason I'm a fan of the character. Uh, but let me know again what you think down below and let me know what you think of the end of the Ultimate Universe. Did you like the videos this week? And uh, and 
this is as much closer as we're going to get for Ultimate Venom because this is kind of where that story ends uh, permanently because now a lot of these characters are part of the main Marvel Universe and they exist now in our universe, which is why Miles is going to cross over with Venom very soon. So again, thanks so much for watching, guys. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.